Hope you're doing great. I just have a frap house card. I don't know what it is. Have you ever seen books at a pet store about the care and feeding of a cat or a hamster or a fish? As far as I know, there has never been a book written on the care of the feeding of your mind. But it's here in God's book, the Bible. How you think really determines how you live. Psychologist William James wrote, the greatest discovery of my generation is that people can change their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. You can really change your life by changing the way you think. And in Proverbs 23, 7, it says, for he is a kind person who is always thinking about the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. In the Bible, the heart and the mind are often synonymous. The heart and the mind are often used as a control center of your life. Think of your mind as a control tower at a large airport. There are jetliners that land and take off every day coordinated by a control tower that is both being fed information and giving out information. What you receive and how you think determines what you give out. And I'm gonna read these two verses. Philippians 4, 8 and 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And here's the wonderful promise in verse 9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Put it into practice. We got to do that. And the God of peace will be with you. And I'm a big fan of Alcoholics Anonymous and the good work they have done in their lives of thousands of people. And they're saying that comes out of AA and And that says it's not our drinking, but our thinking that makes us stinking. (laughs) They're saying the real problem is not their drink, it's the way they think. If you've ever been around a person who drinks a lot, you'll admit both drinking and thinking that makes a person stink. (laughs) A problem with addiction is between a person's ears and how you think will determine your life. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, a man is what he thinks about all day long. So what are you thinking about? How are you thinking? Do you have the kind of positive thought, the processes that allow you to rejoice in the Lord? Or are you someone whose mind has become soured Are you negative and always thinking bad thoughts? Those of you who work with computers are familiar with the old saying, garbage in, garbage out. And if you put garbage in your mind, garbage is gonna come out. But if you put good things in your mind, good things are gonna come out. So, We have two points. And the first point, we have eight eight little things. So first point, 
Feed your mind positive thoughts. Feed your mind positive thoughts. If you want to live a positive life, you must feed your mind with positive thoughts. In Philippians 4.8, this is all about it. And I have taught the book of Philippians many times, but I've never taken the time to dig into verse eight and identify eight qualities of thinking. Analyze it, take it apart, list eight ways that you need to be thinking positive thoughts. Number one, concentrate on real instead of phony things. Whatever is true, there is so much that is plastic in our world today. The world has substitutes and imitations. But the Bible says if you want to think right, you need to think about those things that are true. And the Bible says in John 17, the word is truth. And the more you let the word of God feed your mind, the more you, you'll be thinking about what is true. But the word of God is always true. So you gotta feed your mind with that. Do you have the ability to control your mind? Are you allowing your thoughts to control you? A little girl went to bed one night and after she finished saying her prayers, she said to her mom, this has been a good day. And her mom asked why that was so. And the little girl smiled and said, because today I pushed my thoughts around and yesterday my thoughts pushed me around. You can have the ability to control your thoughts if you so desire. Worry is the thought process that has gone awry. Worry begins as a tiny little drop. And then that drop becomes a steady flow. And then that flow becomes a gusher. And that whole gusher turns into an avalanche of worry and anxiety. And all of us know what it is to lie in bed at night and have one thought captivate us. As if we can't turn our minds off. But you can and you should. If you learn how to think about real instead of phony. Number two, think about noble instead of trivial things. What does noble mean? It means those things that are important, those things that are really matter. Trivial pursuit is a board game based on trivia, but for a lot of people, life is a trivial pursuit. They're only interested in the little things that don't really matter. I dealt with a couple one time who were getting a divorce because they argued about something that was so trivial and they argued about whether or not you should rinse off the dishes before you put them in the dishwasher. <laughs> and he said, no, that's what the dishwashers are for. And she said, yes, you rinse them off, you had to do it before when you put them in the dishwasher. And that becomes such a point of an intense argument. And a cardiologist gave this advice to people who worry. Don't sweat the small things and remember all things are small things. If you tend to worry about the little bitty things, just don't sweat them. Think about those things that are important like the word of God, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the call of God upon your life. Number three, concentrate on what's right instead of the convenient. All of us have a life and we live out our choices. And sometimes we choose that which is expedient and profitable and we take the easy path 
But the Bible says we ought to concentrate on those things that are right. One of the biggest problems for our teenagers and children they're facing today that there is no absolute moral standard. And that's why we need to insist that children, they, they have been taught the word of God and the Bible says there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And we tell them never to do wrong and do right instead. But when you teach children that nothing is absolutely wrong and nothing's absolutely right, they have no moral foundation. They don't know what's right. And they say there are times when it may be good to cheat on your spouse. And there are other times when it's not. And the word of God gives us a moral standard and we need to concentrate on those things that are right instead of convenient. Let me give you an example of a person in the Bible who did what was convenient. Do you remember Pontius Pilate? When he interviewed the Lord Jesus Christ, he found no fault in Jesus and he wanted to let him go. But there was an outcry from the crowd and they said, if you let him go, you're no friend of Caesar. How many of you have made decisions based on what was better for your business than what was right? And the Bible says to feed your mind thoughts about what is right. Number four, concentrate on clean instead of dirty. Scripture says to think on whatever is pure. Now that word pure means morally, sexually pure. But we live in a dirty world and it's getting even dirtier morally. And our world is getting worse and worse and it keeps getting worse and worse until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And those of you who are trying to straddle the fence and live with one foot in the world and one foot in the church, you're going to find that it's like to be a boat leaving the pier. And you're going to have to decide because the world is getting worse and worse. Pornography addiction begins with a thought. And that thought became, became a deed. And that deed became a habit. And that habit became a lifestyle. And that lifestyle becomes a character. And you'd better be careful because character determines your destiny. Pornography is a terrible trap that the devil sets because once a person attains a level of satisfaction in pornography, then they have to get deeper into it and they have to feel satisfaction. And that's the part where our mind comes into play. And if you're looking at those magazines, and if you're looking at those videos, you're gonna be a slave. Turn it off, throw them away. Renounce it and instead put clean thoughts in your mind. You can't have clean thoughts as long as you're looking at those things. Garbage in, garbage out. You know Ted Bundy was a very educated, highly intellectual, professional man, but he was a serial murderer and he probably killed over 50 women. And he was tried and convicted of only one and that was enough to send him to the electric chair. But Dr. James Dobson interviewed him on his radio program and Ted Bundy admitted that his obsession started 
with his involvement with pornography and it got worse and worse and worse. And I wanna tell you the battle is fought in your mind. That's why 2 Corinthians 10, four and five says that Satan sets up the stronghold in our mind. We are cast down to imaginations and bring every thought under the control of Jesus Christ. If you keep thinking dirty thoughts, you're gonna live a dirty life. Number five, concentrate on lovely instead of harmful. Concentrate on lovely instead of harmful. Scripture says if there's anything that's lovely, think about that. It's the word that means that which promotes brotherly love and harmony. Are you the kind of person who always thinks about good people? Are you so distrustful that you hope bad things happen to somebody? Are you contemplating harming someone? Now here's the problem in the Old Testament. If you wanted to hurt somebody, it was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But if you didn't do it, you just thought about it and you were okay. Jesus comes along and says in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, Jesus said this, don't commit murder. But I say unto you that you have hatred in your heart and you're guilty by intent. And Jesus said the same thing about adultery. The Old Testament, not to commit adultery. A guy could think about it, but as long as he didn't do the act, he was innocent. But Jesus comes along in the New Testament and says, if you lust after a woman in your mind, you have committed adultery already. That's why it's important to keep our minds clean. Don't have harmful, hurtful thoughts toward other people. In Arkansas, a lady called the police station and asked the police officer, what is the fine for assault and battery? And the officer said it was $250. Why do you want to know, he asked. And this lady said, well, I'm about to beat up my sister, and I just wanted to see if I could afford it or not. <laughs> Number six, concentrate on helpful instead of critical. The Bible says to think on whatever is admirable, all you have to do is go overseas and work in a mission church and you'll find that we are so absolutely blessed that it really is a sin for anybody to be critical about what God's doing in our churches. If you come to a church looking for something to criticize, you can always find something. But if you come to a church and looking for something that is admirable and good, you can find that too. It just depends on what you're looking and how you're thinking. What is your thought process? The Bible says to think on those things that are helpful and not critical. Do you remember in the Old Testament, Caleb and Joshua along with 10 other spies, were sent to the promised land to scout it out. And those spies were very critical. And they said, we can't do it, we can't do it. They have great armies. And they look like giants and we look like grasshoppers. We can't, we just cannot do it. But Caleb and Joshua came back calling a huge cluster of delicious grapes 
and they told people, look, look, this land is flowing with milk and honey. Let's go in. We can take it. And most people can be categorized in one of these two groups. Those who bring gripes and those who bring grapes. <laughs> Which camp are you in? You're never more like God than when you're building bridges toward other people instead of building barriers when you're tossing bouquets toward people instead of tossing bricks. Number seven, think excellent instead of inferior thoughts. Paul says if anything is excellent, think on those excellent thoughts. What that means is that you're looking for good things. You can usually find good things. But if you're looking for bad things, you can find bad things. It all begins with how you think. I knew a lady in a church, not this church. She had a sour look on her face. And I soon learned that she was not the kind of person that you said, how are you doing? Because she'd really tell you, it would take about 20 minutes to tell you about every ache, every pain, every problem that she had. She had a reputation for being a hypochondriac. But I decided to try to do something with her. And every Sunday, every Sunday when she would leave church, I started saying to her, you sure are looking good. <laughs> You're looking better. What's happened? I just tried to compliment her and say good things about her and find good things about her, before long, she was feeling better. And you ought to try that with somebody. Instead of thinking inferior thoughts about them, try to find good things in them. Think excellent thoughts. Number eight, concentrate on positive instead of negative. Paul says, if anything is praiseworthy, what kind of person are you? Are you a person, are you a positive person or are you a negative person? It begins with the way you think. And I'm a positive person. And when I see a glass, I see it half full. But a negative person says it's half empty. A positive person says every cloud has a silver lining. A negative person says every silver lining is hiding in a cloud. A positive person looks for the pearl in the oyster. A negative person expects to get poison from the oyster. A positive person counts their blessings. A negative person discounts their blessings. A positive person sees opportunity in every difficulty, whereas a negative person sees difficulty in every opportunity. I once read an optimist is a lady who starts putting on her shoes when the preacher says, in conclusion. <laughs> a pessimist is a person who is seasick during the entire voyage of life. When two positive people meet, they shake hands. When two negative people meet, they shake heads. So what kind of person are you? Paul says to fill your mind with positive thoughts, these eight characteristics form a biography of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is true. He's real. 
He's noble. He's right. He's clean. He's loving. He's helpful. He's excellent. Jesus Christ is the most positive person who ever lived. But the devil is negative. Jesus said the thief, that is Satan, comes in to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And so the key is to think about the Lord. Is your problem that you're thinking about fake things, trivial things, convenient things, dirty things, harmful things, critical, inferior, negative thoughts? Yes, my friend, that's your problem. You need to replace those negative thoughts with positive thoughts. That's why Paul says, think on these things. He's not just giving you some suggestion. He's given you a principle for life. And your mind can be controlled by your own conscience, by yourself. It doesn't have to control you. Let me do a little experiment here. Let me borrow your mind for a moment. What if I told you in, for the next minute, don't think about an elephant. Don't think about a long-nosed elephant with big ears and a little tail. Don't think about it honestly. How many of us wouldn't be able to help thinking about an elephant. I did have a lady one time tell me that she didn't think about an elephant. I quoted scripture when you said that and that's the key. She didn't think of an elephant because she was thinking about something else. And what I'm trying to say to you, if you're a guy who constantly says to yourself, don't think about lust, Guess what? You're going to think about it. But if you replace that negative thought with something else positive, that's the secret. Now try this. I would like to ask you to see on your screen of your consciousness the Lord Jesus Christ hanging on a cross. Picture him with his outstretched hands, nails piercing his hands and his feet and a crown of thorns on his head. And he is hanging there with the look of love in his eyes. And he says to you, I love you, and I did this for you. Did you think about an elephant? No. The mind is an amazing thing, but it can only grab hold of one image at a time. You can go back and forth quickly, but you can only hang on to one image at a time. And so the way you improve your thinking is that by the act of your surrendered will, you say, I'm going to think about good things. I'm going to think about the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time that temptation to lust comes in your mind, you need to think about the Lord Jesus Christ. For those of you who have problems about being negative, every time that negative thought rises up, you need to think about the Lord Jesus Christ. So number two, follow through with positive actions. This is gonna be quick. Paul says whatever you learn from him, put it in to practice. There are some people who are given, but they don't really receive. There are some people who listen, but they don't really hear. 
That's why Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And there are some people who watch, but they don't really see. And Paul says, once you have learned the truth, once you've received it, once you've heard it, once you've seen it, then he says, practice it. It's not that we don't know what to do, it's that we're not doing what we know to do. And that's what the Bible says. There needs to be discipline to put these principles, your learning in to practice. You gotta practice this. Bob Whitman, who's the father of two children and a businessman, lives on the West Coast. He trains as a triathlete. Every morning he gets up at 3.30 and he jogs 10 miles and he rides his bicycle 40 miles and then he swims a mile. And by that time, it's 7.30 in the morning. He does it every day. Why? Because he wants to succeed as a triathlete. And you know, my favorite basketball player, is Larry Bird. I I loved him. I believe he practiced more than anybody else. Beginning when he was in high school, he practiced over, he stayed and shot a hundred free throws. He was playing at Indiana State and he did the same. And when he moved to the Boston Celtics, he would do the same. That was his dedication. That was his commitment to excellence. Practice. Practice, practice, practice. Doesn't mean doing something one time. It means to do it and keep on doing it. And I say that because there are some people who lack discipline to keep on doing what you know to do. Some of you have started a quiet time, which you stopped it. Some of you started tithing, but you stopped it. Some of you have a regular prayer time, but you've stopped it. You haven't continued. Life is not practice. Paul says the things you ought to do, do them. And here's the promise. The God of peace will be with you. Do you see how these things flow together? You gotta rejoice in the Lord. Always think about good things and do good things and God will bless you. We're gonna stand and rise. We're gonna have people down here and they will help you with everything they need. They will pray with you, they will encourage you They will do everything they got to do. 